we'll start the uh, last case presentation session. I'm Jenny Davila of Fonte. I'm PGY2 residents here at UVA. And I'll present, be presenting the case of WJ. He's a 71 year old gentleman who had uh, prostatic cancer treated with brachytherapy and external beam radiation therapy, who presents to us with a pretty extensive urological history, including but not limited to urethral stricture, recurrent UTI, and prostatic abscess. This gentleman underwent brachytherapy and external beam radiotherapy for Gleason 7 disease 11 years prior to presenting to us for evaluation. His PSA at the time of treatment was 7.6. He then had a pretty extensive uh, history of sequelae from the radiation treatment. Uh, firstly, he uh, developed a membranous urethral stricture shortly after, about one year after, and underwent dilation of that stricture uh, he began to retain enough to need intermittent catheterization two years after the procedure and had his first TERP three years postoperatively. He did have some urinary incontinence after that TERP. He continued to have other, need other interventions over the next several years. He had repeat dilations under anesthesia um, in years five and six postoperatively. And uh, seven years after the original therapy, he developed a pretty bad episode of sepsis after laser ablation of his prostate. Uh, at that time, he was taken urgently to the OR when it was discovered that he had a pararectal uh, abscess that extended from the periurethral area. Um, at that point, he required uh, Foley catheterization because it was complicated by urine leak from the left urethra into the pelvis. And he kept that Foley catheter as well as a suprapubic uh, catheter for optimal drainage for several months after the abscess was drained. In the following years, he continued to have CIC with increasing difficulty. He started to develop bladder stones from retention, um, as well as chronic UTIs requiring chronic uh, antibiotic therapy, and had a laser ablation of prostatic stones and uh, bladder stones 10 years after his procedure. After this procedure, he became floridly incontinent. He was just, in general, pretty miserable and came to us for uh, evaluation for options for management of this incontinence. His past medical history was otherwise fairly benign. He had some hypertension, some diabetes. Uh, he had no non-urologic surgeries. His family history was notable for a brother with prostate cancer and a sister with uterine cancer. Uh, he's a married man, uh, quit smoking 30 years ago, but had a significant smoking history. He did not drink alcohol. His medications were limited to antihypertensives, some antihyperglycemics, and he was on ciprofloxacin in the presentation, had previously been treated with uh, Augmentin and with Bactrim at various points in his course. He had no allergies. On physical exam, he had a normal phallus. He had uh, continuous incontinence per urethra, and he had incontinence-associated dermatitis because he was wearing adult briefs. His prostate on DRE was firm, flat, and hard, consistent with the history of radiation. I'm showing you uh, picture images from the CT scan he got at the time of his uh, laser ablation of prostatic stone. And you can see that he's got the remainder of seeds had been losing some of those per urethra. And then he had this fluid-filled cavity. It's actually a fairly capacious aspect of his prostatic urethra. So we have a 72-year-old gentleman uh, after brachytherapy and radiation therapy for <clears throat> prostate cancer with stricture disease, urethral stones, a capacious prostatic urethra with recurrent infection, and now uh, continuing incontinence. So the question is, how do we manage this job? Let's go back to your first slide. Sure. Oh. Sixty-one year old male, um, brachytherapy, external beam. What mistake was made right there? So you know he's going to do, he's fairly young for this. You know with radiation therapy he's there's a goodly chance that he'll develop stricture disease. Not goodly, but what, what 
I don't know who did the breaking therapy and who did the external beam. One of the, so, one of the things that you have to be absolutely cognizant of is what went wrong. So, I for one of my asking questions, so I appreciate that. Uh, why doesn't everybody get stricture? So it'll depend on the size of the prostate, depend on the dose of the radiation. So the symmetry and placement of the stones, I can have in the seeds. So basically what happens is that as you increase the concentration of the seeds in the carrying lethal environment, you're getting higher and higher growth, and eventually they gave a sufficient dose to basically cause an ischemic necrosis. Uh, I commented earlier in my lecture, uh, you have to preserve the urethral integrity. And the minute you do not, you have a disaster. Whether you try or ablate, or any other way you ablate, uh, the minute you, you uh, lose um, uh, vascular supply to that urethra, uh, you have a nightmare on your hands from that point forward. So whoever did the brachytherapy um, either miscalculated the dosimetry or misplaced the seeds, but too many seeds were placed too close to the urethra. You have them out on the side, but remember it all magnifies as you come in, so this is a dosimetry problem. I don't know when this was done, uh, but that's the final issue. So once they start developing our membranous urethral structure, uh, already you know you have a problem on your hands. So then you had multiple interventions. Uh, yes, we all tried dilating them. It's an ischemic, uh, so you know fundamentally that will not work. CIC was a good idea. Uh, the turf you do, but now you're respecting tissue that's necrotic and dead. Uh, so it's an unlined, since you radiated the entire prostate, you're not getting back to healthy tissue. So you could have almost predicted he would be incontinent following the turf. Next. Did multiple interventions you could have predicted right from the get-go. Um, developed sepsis after a laser ablation. I'm not sure who pulled the laser out, but you're lasering necrotic tissue already, which can almost guarantee you're going to create an abscess. So I know that we're seeing good intentions, but if you thought about it a little bit before, the probability of upside was marginal, and the probability of downside was significant. All right, so eventually you necrosed enough tissue that he had a classic uh, watering pot perineum, which is, if you look at the textbook, what that means is someone who has a chronic stricture, trying to avoid against the stricture, they eventually blow out the urethra. In the old days, the abscess would form and eventually drain through the perineum, hence the term watering pot perineum. And so this is classic result of chronic stricture. Again, a disaster to fix. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that, so you have some more stones. The reason the stones are there is because of chronic infection and stasis of urine. Uh, we got a mess. Continue. All right, so we're back to what we have now. So you basically have a healthy bladder, but everything downstream from that is, I would argue, non-viable tissue. I don't do stricture repair, but I even think the picture of uh, stricture repair people uh, are going to say this is not viable. Um, so what options do you have? You, you, you probably cannot do anything with that bladder. Uh, you, you could consider a suprapubic tube, but he's incontinent now, um, so that's a mess. Uh, you could completely divert the urine, and it's said to a two-year-old, that's probably a reasonable idea, though you always have to worry about him maybe irrigating his bladder occasionally because he's gonna have festering stuff. Uh, do you wanna go in there and try to do a radical prostatectomy and pull it out? Probably a disaster, and not something you want to go through. Uh, so, um, He's miserable because he's sitting in urine all the time, correct? Correct. So my suspicion is you're probably going to do some type of ileal uh, uh, urinary diversion or something like defunctionalize the bladder because I think trying to fix anything down there is just cause for disaster. But, but my point is, even if you divert his urine, the story is not ended because he is still prone to getting abscesses and problems in that mess of tissue down there. If he's got an open draining sinus, you probably want to leave it open and let it drain, and it'll drain periodically, and you just have to accept that. The big thing is you want to get it dry so it doesn't have the skin break down. So I think, fortunately, um, was it widespread radiation external beam or just cone down or what? In other words, how irradiated is your bowel, and you run a risk of having a problem with your ileal loop, and you have to go to transverse colon. Now you need to do a little digging to see how much radiation you got. Because the last thing you want to do is make ileal Ilia loop out of radiated bowel and have that break down and have another right. series of disasters. Well, what we ended up doing was going to the OR and yeah. the radiation was limited enough that we were able to do uh, 
Heliocon, but urinary and diversion without cystectomy. Why is it not to do the cystectomy? Because you would have gotten down to the prostate and had a concrete block uh, that, that you would have Essentially, the radiation down there. Given that there was no concern for TCC, although the smoking history, you know, you're like, well, yeah. either way. But given the, <clears throat> the extensive the inflammation and radiation, I think well, the wiser well, is not. The story's not over yet, right? No, no. no. All of those right things that you right. mentioned. <laughs> uh, so immediately, postoperatively, he did fair. He did well. Um, he did have the complication of a C diff uh, colitis, okay. colitis, but was uh, sub subsequently did well for nearly a year. Yeah. When he represented, he presented. Um, and did, was there any plan uh, on how to manage a depunctionalized bladder? I'm not sure. Because that's where I would have, if he was had a catheterizable track. Irrigating, having them back, back even once every quarter, put a catheter in, wash that bladder out with a couple of 600 cc's of saline, and, and, and allow that to breed out. I think, my, because you know you've got the chronic tissue in there, you know you have uh, infected tissue in there. Now you have something that's not draining as well and is a setup to create sepsis. So I suspect he presented with sepsis? He presented with fecal urea. Fecal urea? Yeah, he, he had uh, feculent urea. Uh, Urine um, per urethra. He well, started drinking urine, brown stuff of, of, from yeah. a rectal so physical fistula. fistula. Yep. So this is after the tube is, has been placed, and you can see extra of here oh. in this area um, from a, a prior uh, contrast study, where it and you can see the tracking into that capacious. Some more prostatic urethral area. Now you thank God your urologist and your general surgeon has to fix this. And, and then our <laughs> colleagues in general surgery did perform an encolostomy exactly. with Hartman's pouch. Yep. And um, he did well with that for nearly a year, but then again began having uh, recurrent foul smelling mucus damage from, that, uh, from his urethra from 11 the, months after. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And looking here, you see uh, again that. The whole area is filled with uh, fluid as well as air, again, mucus from the Hartman's pouch. And so, where is he draining into the perineum? So he's actually still draining per urethra. Per urethra. Mm -hmm. Can you put that CT back? How, how, can, you, can you palpate anything in his perineum? Is he, is he pointing to any place? He uh, basically just complains of the smell, the smell and the drainage. Right, because we inadequately drain wounds. So you got an abscess that's inadequately drained, so the question is, can you do an IND to get that and marsupialize it? Because what you want to do is get that so it drains on a regular basis, so we can take go into a shower, take the shower and wash that out on a regular basis so the air in the collection doesn't get there. So somehow exteriorizing that abscess cavity is what I would consider is, is the next step. So what, what happened was actually we took a, a look directly at during the Hartman's procedure so you prior, the scope down. Mm -hmm. and um, what was seen there was they could see bowel mucosa <laughs> from the bladder itself. So the assumption was that this this mucus drainage was accumulating in the in the bladder. You, you scope what? So they scoped per urethra, per the urethra. In, into the bladder, <coughs> and from the bladder could see bowel right, mucosa. So you got a so, classic best co right. fish. <coughs> no surprise. And so they fixed it by. Supertrigonal cystectomy. At his last follow-up, he was doing well, down from. Uh, All right, so you, you did what you were, were trying to avoid doing before, and you might have done exactly. Um, down from five to six pads a day of offensive foul-smelling uh, discharge to one pad per day, um, just really. Was the benign. collection actually in the bladder, or was the collection outside the bladder? Go back to your CT. You say that's the base of the bladder, or it's in the prostate? I think it's in the prostate. I mean, the bladder was decompressed on this scan. So how did the supertrigonal... Going to fix this. Pardon? How did the supertrigonal fix? Yeah. Presumably this. I would have... Was it an easy cystectomy? I was not present. I suspect it was a disaster. Difficult. I mean, you got away with it great, but... In the only aluminum way, it was not an easy cystectomy, a concrete block down there. Um, the issue is, is an undrained abscess, and to me, the other approach would be potentially to, as I said, exteriorize that prostatic. Mm -hmm. You've got sinus 
I wouldn't be surprised if you had signage tracks already draining. <coughs> the question is hoping that out uh, to drain might have been an easier course for this guy. Because with, you, with a super tricolonal cystectomy, you expose them to the, uh, all the bowel obstruction, all the post problems of the cystectomy, which obviously you would get. But, uh, and these are the sad cases that a lot of this is iatrogenic. You took a guy who, God knows whether he would or not have died of prostate cancer, but made his life miserable for, for, for decades. And this is where, uh, to me, this is the, we, we had that conversation at lunch. If you take someone who's perfectly healthy and feeling well and do something to them, for God's sake, don't make them miserable right after this. So this is where we get a bad, bad rep on this, this disease. The other question is, what's the benefit to combine external beam therapy and radiation and radiation? For gleason seven over just full dose external beam alone. Well, and that's exactly what we talked earlier. The outcome. Because I think the only surgeries I've ever seen are the patients that have had both. If it, I have had seen surgeries of Reiki only or external beam. I have, I've seen I have a handful, but I have a handful of patients that have had gone elsewhere. One, and there's, there's one radiologist, excuse me, one, one urologist in our area who was quick to get on the seed bandwagon and just kept dying these things and the number of strictures. Seeds alone can structure and return. Yeah, but the combination seems to be even worse. It's like everything else. There's a skill and there's not a skill. And this is basically the person who is not well trained to do this stuff. It shouldn't be. I mean, you're allowed one of these, but uh, if you've got a couple, it's wrong. Um, but it's the, the problem was is too much radiation, too close to the urethra, ischemic necrosis, and all the downstream <coughs> complications you could have predicted.